Next, we're going to define what is called a language. So for those in context, um, when I talk about a language here, I'm talking about a formal language. So this all a language is is a set of strings, a set of strings whose symbols come from some alphabet, from some alphabet. So let's talk about, so now you might be looking at it and be like, Dan, that's all a language is? <laughs> it, it, this, this is it. This is it. There's nothing, there's nothing scary about this. Um, however, uh, we're going to see that this concept, this, just having a set of strings, unbelievably generalizes another notion that we're going to talk about in a moment. But I think it's important that we see some examples. So let's talk about first the language consisting consisting of all binary strings. So naturally it's over the binary alphabet, for example. It could be. Binary strings starting with a one is as follows. So for example, I could describe this to you. Now I could do this more formally, naturally, um, but I'll just describe it using a, a just a literal description of the set, but not, it won't include all the elements. I can't list them all because there's an infinite number of them. But notice that these are going to be all strings that start with one. And that's a language. Right? That's just, this is just an example of a language, just a set of strings who come from some alphabet. So next, let's talk about the set of all binary strings. A set of all binary strings whose value, so if you interpret this binary string as a number, whose value, value in binary, is prime. So I could, for example, describe to you what amounts to the binary representation of a prime number. Now, for those that aren't familiar with what a prime number is, it is simply a positive integer whose the number of divisors is exactly equal to two. One and itself. That isn't one. Right? So it has to have two distinct divisors. So for example, two is a prime number. Uh, three is a prime number. Five is a prime number. Seven is a prime number. Eleven is a prime number. I encourage you to think about why those are prime numbers based on what I just said. So I could write out those actually like this. So for example, one, zero. This in binary, what is that in binary? Now it's not a 10, it's in binary. So, so you have each of these represents a, a successive power of two starting from the left side. So this would be the highest power of two. So I have two of these here, so it starts to the power of one, to the power of zero, but I take whatever this toggle is on to mean I include that in the running total. So I start over here on the right to the power of zero, which is just one. Um, notice that this is a zero here, so I don't include that in the sum. Plus to the power of one times one is just one times two, right? So that's just, so, so this one is two. That's two. The next one is naturally three. So notice here that this is to the power of zero times one plus to the power of one times one. That's three. So the next one here is three. And then next I could talk about one zero one. 
So to the power of zero times one is one, plus zero times two to the power of one, that's zero, plus one, which is one so far, plus two squared times one, which makes, that's four, so I add that to my total, that's five. And naturally, I could keep doing this. So this is actually seven. I'll let you think about that one. But there's a, this set is infinite in size. There's an infinite number of prime numbers. So uh, one thing I will acknowledge here is that there's many ways to represent prime numbers using binary sequences. I'm going to presume in this example, as I'm going to do later, that we're talking about the most compact version. We're not padding these with zeros, OK? Why? Because those might represent all sorts of other things. <laughs> but I'm just going to keep it simple here, and I must stress that you can take that set and you can easily generalize it by padding two zeros in any one of these, for example. But the point is, is that each of these represents a prime number. So just as a fun little note, I will point out here, is notice that every one of these actually starts with a leading one. So that's actually one of the main reasons why I'm bringing this up. So you won't have any of these, as I've described them to you, ever have a zero in front at the beginning of the string. So let's talk about some more examples. So sigma star or, or Kleene star. This is a language. So this is for any alphabet. Now, you'll notice in my definition, I say it's a set of strings whose symbols come from some alphabet. I have a question for you. Is the empty set a language? Is the empty set a language based on this definition up here? So think about it. It just says a set of strings whose symbols come from some alphabet. Now, indeed, an alphabet is non-empty, right? It's a non-empty set of symbols. However, remember that it's just a set of strings. But you notice that I didn't say that the set of strings is non-empty. So yes, it is a language. Very good, very good. So, so this is what we would refer to as the empty language. So empty set, empty language, quite natural. <laughs> is the empty language. So indeed, the empty set is the empty language. And I must stress that it could be over any alphabet. So it doesn't matter what the alphabet is, empty language, it's a language. <laughs> so now, this brings me to some interesting revelation. Now, if you've never heard of this before, this might completely blow your mind. <laughs> but, and, that's, and I must stress that when I first heard this, it, it got me really excited. And this is something that once you kind of see it, you can't unsee it. And this is something that I, especially when I talk about analysis of algorithms, when we talk about algorithms, I think it's something that it's important to kind of put into the back of your mind. Is that once you start talking about languages, it actually provides a framework for which you can discuss all sorts of different things. Namely, a natural one that you see a lot in theoretical computer science is the idea that you can ask a very simple question about a language. So if I give you one of these languages over here, is, so does a string, does a string belong to a language? Very natural question, right? Does a string belong to a language? 
<laughs> That's, you might ask, Dad, why does that matter so much? Well, let me let me try to try to frame this carefully for you. More formally, more formally, problems. And specifically, I'm talking about computational problems. So these are the kind of things you run into when you study computer science. Or, for example, you, you, if you have, you probably have encountered the scenario I'm talking about in some way, shape, or form. Um, we can have all sorts of fun discussion about it, but most certainly I'm going to keep this specifically limited to certain kinds of problems for the point of our discussion here. Okay? So problems can be defined defined as languages. So in the world of theory of computation, very often you'll find that people use the word problem and language almost interchangeably. Depending on the class of problems you're talking about, you can use a concept of a language to talk about what a problem is. And once you do it, it just blows your mind. So let me give you an idea of what I'm talking about here. In particular, I must stress that for certain problems, there is a direct correspondence between the idea of a problem and a language. And asking, does a string belong to a language? So I could talk about a problem in a specific way. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it like this. So a problem. So it can be, and I must stress that can be doesn't mean it necessarily will. It's just that it can be. So there's different types of problems out there. For example, you might be familiar with uh, what we call function problems. This would include uh, cases like I give you an array and I would like you to sort the array. So notice that there isn't like a question being asked. It's just I have my input, now do this to it. You can describe things like that in terms of languages, but I will not focus on that here. Likewise, you could talk about things like optimization problems. These are where you have given an objective function and you have some constraints in place, and you have to decide by computing the best of possible feasible answers, the optimal one or an optimal one. Uh, these, for example, can be paraphrased as a kind of what we're going to talk about here. Uh, namely, uh, what we call a decision problem. Those are the ones I'm going to talk about here. So these can be described as deciding, and I use the word decide very specifically, deciding if a string, which I must stress that these can be binary strings, which in the context of theory of computation, almost always is just presumed to be the, the default, is the binary, uh, binary strings. And you don't lose anything by doing that. I'll let you think about that, or if you have questions about it, you can welcome to bug me about it. I will most certainly answer it. Such as binary strings, which we can presume we can presume without loss of generality. So, so there's just a certain step you have to do to convert any arbitrary alphabet to the binary alphabet, or take binary strings, sorry, strings of some alphabet and convert them over to binary strings. If you're familiar with encoding strings, it, say for example, ASCII characters, these can represent bytes or sequences of bits, and you can write them out as zeros and ones, like you would on an actual computer, like a tangible one in front of you that you might be watching this on. That's a very natural thing to think about, and that's very much the same kind of reasoning I'm talking about here. So it's nothing too abstract or strange in that regard. So, so naturally, um, deciding if a string belongs belongs to some language so just to be a bit more precise about my language here so when l is a language so i'll abbreviate language with lang like this over some alphabet sigma 
what I could do is I could ask a very simple question. Given a string w, which is going to be of all possible strings in the alphabet, so sigma star. So remember, this just simply means all possible strings that you over that alphabet. So for example, if this is the binary alphabet, this is all possible binary strings, okay? So all of them are finite in length, but it's all possible ones. Is W in L, so this means in, or is it that W is not in L? So if we can try answering this question for some language, there's actually a natural way of talking about this from a computational standpoint. So this brings me to talking about what a decision problem is. So I'm going to give a formal definition of what this is. You may have heard of what a decision problem is at a higher level. I'm going to show you that that notion is no different than here. So if you've never seen this before, you're going to kind of have your socks blown off. Not literally, but figuratively. Formally, a decision problem, so this is how you traditionally will define a decision problem. A decision problem is where, so what I prompt, prompt you with here is actually, what I, my claim is that this is the decision problem, is where for every, for every string w in the of all the binary strings, W has an answer. Has an answer of either yes or no. As let's say not, but we'll stick with no. <laughs> so for any one of the strings, you can either, for each one, we'll have an answer of yes or no. Do you see how this looks awfully familiar to what I just described up here? Is it in the language or is it not in the language? So, so let's think about this. Sorry, I get really excited. So the big thing I really want you to notice here is a decision problem problem is specified is specified as a language so you could specify a decision problem by a language l which is going to be some subset of all possible binary strings where Conveniently, this is how we define this, where every string, where every string in L answers yes. So all the all the binary strings that answer yes, they are a part of this language. And that language is what specifies the decision problem. So this is one way you can do that. So just to put it all together into a bow, I need to put this all in nice connection for us. So I want you to just kind of just digest what I just wrote there and try to think about the connection between L and what it means for a decision problem to answer yes. And then once you see that, really what we're talking about are languages. At least over all the binary strings, which isn't quite exactly how somebody approaching, say, problem solving from a higher level algorithms perspective may think about this. So I'm going to be addressing that. But first I'll do an example, but let me just make sure it's clear what we're, what's going on here. So a string. So once you get the connection between these two things, which is as follows, a string W is in L, 
if and only if, if and only if, so just for context for those that are aware of what if and only if means, whatever I write over here, if this is true, whatever comes after this also has to be true. If this is false, then whatever's coming after here is also false. So please keep that in mind. So a string W is in L, which is a subset of the binary strings. If and only if W's answer is yes. So we characterize a decision problem actually by the answers yes as a language. So that's actually how you could define what a decision problem can be specified as. It's a, it's a language. And what is that? Let's, let's, let's kind of dip in with an example here, okay? So we're going to talk about, because I brought up uh, the set of all binary strings that represent a prime number in binary, let's do an example just to illustrate this point. So let's talk about primality testing. So this is testing if a number is a prime number or not. A very relevant problem for those that are interested in, say, cryptography or number theory. So this is just the problem of testing, of testing if a number, if a number is prime can be described by a language. Described by a language. What's that language? Well, we actually we alluded to this earlier, but let me write it in a somewhat more formal way. So rather than explicitly trying to write out a sequence of binary Strings, I'll write it with what we call set builder notation. So, so these are all going to be, so these are all binary strings. So these, each one of my strings in this set is going to be a binary string. Such that, that's what this bar will represent. This means such that, such that, such that W is a binary representation of a prime number. And we're not talking about padding this thing with zeros, just to be very clear. Now, let's put this within the framework that we just talked about, okay? Let's put it all together in a nice framework. So if, if given a string w, which is a part of the binary L, the binary strings, Say yes if W is in that language, LP, and no otherwise. So do you notice that if I were to pull up what this language is, it contains all of the binary strings that whose representations are prime numbers in binary, right? So whenever I give you a binary string, and it is, it is in this set, right? Whenever it isn't, it's not in this set. So just as some examples, just to illustrate my point. So if I give you a binary string 1101, is this in LP or is it not? Let's walk through how we would compute this this number in binary and convert it over to something we're a little bit more familiar with in decimal. So let's see. 1, because it's 2 to the power of 0 times 1. 1 plus, okay, nothing for the power of, of 2 to the power of 1, right? We go 2 squared. So 1 plus 4, that's 5, right? The next power of 2 is what? It's, what is the next power of 2? We have 2, 4, 8. It is a 1 there, so we take our result of 5 plus 8, which this number is what then? What is that binary string actually representing? It is... What is this number? 
as a number, to be a bit more precise. It's 13. It's, it's very good, very good, very good, everybody. 13. So that means that this is in, this is definitely in LP, right? 13 is prime. So if we wanted to consider binary strings like these, we might need more computational resources to determine if they're an LP or not. So it's going to take a little bit more clever thinking to determine cases like these. How about if I give you a binary string that's just a zero like this? So remember, it's over all the binary strings. That includes this one right here. Is that representing a prime number? And I must stress that we're using a typical representation as per my example earlier when I was defining languages. So for example, this, this zero doesn't represent like turning on a switch or something like that. It doesn't. <laughs> so this would be zero times to the power of zero, which is just zero. Is zero a prime number? So remember, this is just zero, right? That's just zero. That is not in this language, correct? That's so. So in this case, no. Because every, because every, this is every, let me just, <laughs> every, that says every, it's sort of melted in the microwave. Every integer that is positive begins with a one. Right? So notice that you know right away this is not going to be in the language. In fact, all strings that start off with a zero, as per our discussion previously, are not in LP. So just as a natural question about this, uh, you can also say by the same proxy that 0, 0, 1, 0 is also not in this language either. So I must stress that these are easy to test for. You just see if the first symbol is a 0 or not. And I remember in our representation of these binary numbers, I'm not including the padding of these. So this reasoning only applies because we're presuming that there is no padding on the binary strings. I could easily change that if needed, but I am not most certainly talking about those types of binary strings. Is that clear, everybody? So these are examples of binary strings that are in the language or not in the language. And you can see that this is the same as me posing a question to you, right? So notice that any one of the binary strings that is a yes answer is in this language. Anyone that is not, and that includes, that includes all of the junk too, like this one right here. <laughs> so these cases are not terribly interesting because you could, they're just junk. <laughs> so please just keep it on the back of your mind. Like pick it up like a, a feather, tell your little, little triceratops friend to say, okay, remember this, remember this. <laughs> hello, hello. Welcome on in. <laughs> Welcome on in. Hope you're having a beautiful day. Now. Now that, so is this example clear to everybody? So, so now we could talk about a decision problem as a language, but please take note that I'm talking still about strings and I'm talking about them being in a language or not in a language, but they're overall possible binary strings. So I want to really kind of hammer in this idea that really this framework is quite natural, even without thinking about them all as binary strings. So let's talk about this. And this, the main reason why I mention this is because sometimes people ask me, Dan, what does this have to do with like designing algorithms and all this stuff? I, I, I think it's seeing it from a big picture standpoint is very helpful. I remember when I was first learning about this stuff, like, like sure, there's times when I was learning it myself and then seeing it in a course, I remember it being 
unfortunately disappointing <laughs> because we never kind of talk about the big picture of this. Like, how does this fit in to the concepts that we may have talked about maybe in, I say, data structures and algorithms course? So how does this all fit together? So if you may or may not have seen this in relation to this, if you have. So, so please remember that this is just still, a, these are all binary strings, right? But they could literally just be strings. So it may be useful to talk about a language only in the context of talking about, oh, they're just strings. They're just strings of ones and zeros. But for those that are familiar with computing, you might know that strings of zeros and ones don't just have to be strings. Sure, they are literally strings of binary, right? <laughs> they're just bits, but they could represent many more things. They are, you could abstract on top of those to mean all sorts of different things. And that's where I'm going here. So, so while, it is sometimes sometimes helpful helpful to view languages languages as only only containing strings which is what their definition is right only containing strings only containing strings, strings can also encode, because remember, there's this idea of encoding things. I could describe things to you, right? Strings can also encode or represent, encode or represent, represent, Mathematical, I, 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 I had to use the M word, okay, everybody, I apologize. But if you're not liking the word mathematical, just think of things like a list. If I give you two numbers as input, do something. Uh, you can think of an array, you can think of a tree, you can think of a graph. That's what I'm referring to. Represent mathematical objects such as numbers. Uh, formulae, so if we're talking about like a logic formulae, like a well-formed formula, for example, formulae, it could also be uh, even a graph. And this isn't really that strange of an idea, like I said previously. Remember, all the time when we use a computer, at the lowest level, you could think of data as just zeros and ones, right? It's not a strange idea, at least from a computational standpoint, that view computers at these days especially, just as just a bunch of zeros and ones. So, for example, if I take a graph and I represent it on a computer, that graph is going to be at some point represented as a bunch of zeros and ones. So the idea is not that alien, at least if you're thinking about it like that. Naturally, those strings of zeros and ones have a length. That's what you would refer to as your input size. Right? So for each problem you define something called the input size, that's the same concept that you talk about in analysis of algorithms, for example. But at a theoretical level, I must stress that the way you encode these objects is very particular and not really for things like unary, which that is a whole other topic that I will not be discussing here, but if you're curious about it, please let me know. Um, just please be aware that you can take binary strings and they can represent stuff. That's the point I'm getting at. So at a higher level, just kind of take a step backwards, okay? Because at higher level, I'll refer to these as higher level problems. Just although this is typically how you would talk about a computational problem in the first place. At least before you would see something like a language like this. So in algorithms, So higher level problems are defined as what? So if you've seen some of my lectures before, or maybe you've, you've, uh, you've heard about this before, maybe in a course you've taken, or maybe you're just curious about this, you might be familiar with a picture that looks kind of like this. Like you have all these problem instances. 
have a whole bunch of problem instances. This could be potentially infinite. Usually it is. And we refer to each one of these dots in the circle or weird blob shape. I don't want to give it a prescribe it a shape. It's a sort of weird look. And it, the point is it doesn't matter. Those dots, when I try to use an algorithm to solve a problem, it has to solve every one of the dots and produces correct the answer every single time, right? Has to produce correct solution every single time. That's what we would mean for an algorithm to solve a problem, correct? That's a classical way of viewing algorithms and problem solving. So let me just characterize that here now. So in algorithms, problems are defined as a set of problem instances, or just simply instances. Now, if you're not familiar with that terminology, all I'm really saying is that this is, they are the possible inputs. They're the possible inputs. Now, what makes this a little different than just simply what we talked about over there, where we say the input is always a binary string, right? But we said it's any binary string. On the most purest level, an algorithm has to be able to solve the input, like regardless of, it has to be any binary string. That's the most purest way of looking at algorithmic problem solving. So I'm going to show you, show you that actually it doesn't have to feel like that, or, or does it need to be like that? That's the point I'm getting at. So watch this, where, where the form, where the form of the input, form of the input is explicitly, explicitly defined by other mathematical objects other than binary strings. Like not only, it's just not just a string, it's just defined by other mathematical objects. By other mathematical objects. Not only, and I, I use this, just I'm using this at a higher level, okay? So I'm not saying that these are not encodings of binary strings, I'm saying they're not just any arbitrary binary string. That's what I'm getting at. Because sometimes, when you encode these objects into zeros and ones, they may not actually have always a corresponding binary string. So if I go through and enumerate all the possible binary strings, some of them are actually not going to represent some input of my problem. That's the point I'm getting at. That's kind of the gap between these two things. So I want to address that for you. So not only a string from or in, I'll just say in, in the set of all possible binary strings. So we can adopt, we can adopt the same, the same definition, the same definition for decision problem problem here as well. So please just, this is sort of my way of saying, even though your input won't always be some arbitrary binary string, at a higher level, what we're doing is actually the same thing. That's what I'm going at. <laughs> so let me just explain here now. And I must stress, this isn't the only way you can go about this, okay? So this is just one way of thinking about it. But I must stress that they're all things you can just sit down and actually prove through very, I would argue, relatively simple arguments. Using all the terminology we've talked about up to this point. So remember, when we talk about a problem in this more abstract or higher level sense, you could, for example, be talking about like um, a decision problem of a different form. For example, it could be given an array A and a key X or a value X, I want to know if X is in the array. Notice that has a very specific form. 
what you would do in that case is you could imagine each instance of that problem as a string of zeros and ones for which each one of the elements and the value x are encoded in binary. So every one of the instances will have its own encoding. And once you view it like that, then now the decision problem is actually specified by all of those instances that are encodings of arrays and with a value for which the answer is yes. So that's how you could frame this framework we just talked about where you specify all the yes answers as a language. But traditionally speaking, you'd have it where we have the ones that are like yes and the other ones that are the answers no. But the point is, is that it still fits like a glove into this other framework that we just talked about here. Because remember, and I'll, like I mentioned, it's not, it's not, it's going to be a little weird at first. But the point I'm getting at, let me just summarize what I just said in broader terms. Define an encoding, which I'm not going to refer to this so much. I'm not going to tell you what the encoding is here. Um, just take my word, at least in this lecture, when I use the word encoding, I'm just saying you have your instance. Like we think about like the search problem or if we talk about primality testing, you can imagine I'm taking that and I encode it as a binary string. Define an encoding that takes each instance of your problem, each instance, and represent it, represent it as a binary string, a binary string in, in zero, in the set of all binary strings. So you're defining a way of encoding this information into just pure bits, right? <laughs> That's, and this isn't a strange idea, it's very intuitive, right? This is what computers do. <laughs> It's this is, like your computer isn't literally when I give you a, two numbers as input, it doesn't when it's processing instructions, it isn't just literally saying, hey, look, these are two numbers. Now do the thing. That's a very high level way of looking at this. It's actually an abstraction of what we're talking about here. It's just you encode the instance as binary that has a length, by the way, just in the exact same way I defined length of a string e earlier, right? So. That's, hopefully I'm connecting some dots for you that are very, they're very much there. Uh, but I'm not talking about how the encoding happens because there's different encoding schemes that exist. Some do not provide theoretically the framework that you would like to for if you're thinking about analysis of algorithms and computers. Other ones create encodings that are very, very long strings that are not going to represent things that make a whole lot of sense. Um, Namely, I'm pointing at you, Unary, yeah, somewhere over there in the corner. <laughs> but that's a whole other topic for another time. The point is, is just that this exists. So whatever any binary string, so remember, I take e so I can imagine I have each one of the instances I can represent as a binary string. So this is just a conversion. So the encoding defines a function that's going to take each one of my instances translates it to some binary string. Now, there's going to be binary strings that actually don't map with any one of these encodings. I referred to them colloquially earlier as junk. And that's how I like to think about them. Whenever any binary string in, in here does not correspond correspond to the encoding to the encoding encoding of an instance of an instance assign uh, assign its answer and I'm going to do this for convenience purposes there's several other ways we can address this issue to no. So what does that mean when I say that I, every one of these other ones are no? Well, what does that mean? They're not in the language that corresponds, to, that specifies the decision problem. 
That's what I'm getting at. So all of those strings that are not in the specified by the language, those could be the junk ones. They could also be no answers. So just be aware that there's sort of an asymmetry here. <laughs> so the instances, so when we talk about our problem, the instances, so the instances of our problem, so we're talking at the higher level here, that have, yes, answers are called yes instances. And instances and instances that have no answers are no instances. So the big thing, the big kind of revelation with all of this, just to be very clear, is that every time you're looking for a yes instance, the two notions match exactly. <laughs> That's the point I'm getting at. So observe. That answers, that answers for all instances of the higher level problem higher level problem and their binary encodings they're encoded binary strings as per what my discretion what I described up here encoded binary strings match. So the big point I'm getting at, this is the big takeaway of all of this. So regardless, so regardless if we adopt If we adopt the more formal, I should put more in parentheses because I would argue that when people think about problems, they often are given formal definitions, but this is more formal, so even further lower level from a theoretic standpoint. The more formal definition or the higher level definition of a decision problem it captures the same correspondence right Namely what? It's that if I get a yes answer, that is a part of the language that specifies the decision problem, right? And that's true regardless if you're talking about encoded objects that, are bi that can be in turn encoded into binary strings. And all of those instances that answer yes, they would be a part of the same language even if I considered all binary strings. Hopefully that's interesting. I think this is, this is uh, I'm trying to explain a very interesting abstraction issue here. So please take in mind that what I'm doing is I'm showing you that if, say, if you learn about decision problems, say, like just an algorithm design course, I'm talking about the same concept um, as opposed to a theory of computation, more formal, more formal, I don't like using that phrase because they're both technically formal, but this is more formal, more lower level. Uh, these are the same things. So hopefully you thought that was interesting. So I thought I would show you an interesting framework for which, one, well, one, what a language is, and two, the connection, a connection among others between languages and decision problems, and how you can relate that to a higher level version 
of talking about decision problems. So really when we talk about language, it's really the same thing, right? In fact, many times when you talk to somebody that studies algorithms or theory of computation, they'll use the word language and problem almost interchangeably, depending on which one's more useful for the conversation. For example, if we're talking about just specifically the strings and something about those strings at a lower level, they might use the word, the, the researcher may use the word language. Um, or they may, at a higher level, what they're talking about, like we talked about here, like a, just a problem, uh, thinking about just trying to solve it, they might think of it at a higher level because the way I describe the problem to you depends on objects that are described to the person as input, and I'm expecting some output. In this case, we're talking about yes or no answers. So just to summarize our last point, so in summary, is that it is possible it is possible to describe describe any decision problem which i must stress that decision problems are normally framed as questions akin to my examples for example i give you a binary string and i want to know is the binary string in the language. In that case, it was. It does it have a bi? It's. Is it. Is it representing a prime number in binary? Um, that's a yes or no question. Uh, likewise, you could talk about search problem at a higher level. We talked about the idea that you could. Yeah, you could encode the array and the values, and you could ask the question: Is x in the array? So it pertains to some part of the input. You'd ask. It's a question, right? Yes or no. Describe any decision problem as a language and vice versa. That's the big thing I really want to hammer in. As a language and vice versa. So we can use these terms interchangeably. So somebody talks about a problem, talks about language. In this context, they're the exact same thing. 